dealing with the king. If you wanna come and get it, let the outlaw get you out your seats. You want sports talk politics? He don't give a shit. Broken says speaks, follow it. About to issue y'all a master class. You wanna pass? Come slinging the new podcast, eat candy ass. Robert Toss, bitch, get information. It's your boy John Roker. Welcome to the Outlaw Nation. All right, welcome everybody to this week's edition of the Outlaw Nation podcast. I am your host, John Roca, a.k.a. The Outlaw. Thank you so much for downloading this week's episode on the SK Plus podcast channel. Hey, you guys know there's a lot of awesome shows on this channel. The After Schmodown, The Schmodown Rundown, Wangers, uh, <clears throat> Don't Be a Beardo, and also, of course, The Top Ten Show, which comes out every Tuesday at midnight. And I don't mean Tuesday into Wednesday, I mean Monday into Tuesday. We want to get a jump on the week. Make sure you wake up Tuesday morning. You've got a brand new episode of the Top 10 Show waiting for you. Matt Nost and I love doing that for you. And of course, I hope you listened to last week, or the most recent one, rather, it's Top 10 Heist Movies, which we did in honor of Logan Lucky, uh, which is the new Soderbergh film that's coming out, which looks really funny, and I hope it's good. Like, let me just say that. It looks really funny, and I hope it's good. Uh, so there you go. Um, I hope you all are doing well. I know. It, listen, I know it's been an incredibly tough week in our country. Um, I wasn't even sure if I was going to record an episode this week. I'll be honest with you. It was uh, this uh, week hit a lot of buttons for me emotionally and personally because of the fact that I lived in Charlottesville for a year and a half and that uh, my friend, uh, my best friend is the city manager there. So this, what happened this past uh, weekend really just affected me deeply uh, in ways that the other stuff that Trump has done during his presidency hasn't uh, gone as deep for me. Uh, but there's so much it was in, that's involved here. And, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much of the podcast talking because I don't want you guys to get like depressed or down or, you know, I want to keep you guys uplifted uh, and ladies too. I'm sorry. I keep saying you guys, I mean all of you, men, women and men. So I don't know how, <clears throat> I don't know the term to use to say Everyone. Well, I'm able to say everyone then. I want to keep everyone, like, keep their spirits up. But, uh, you know, we can't, it isn't necessarily a negative to talk about this kind of stuff and go through it and figure it out. And maybe there's a way out and maybe there's some kind of release for you all to hear me talk about it. I don't know. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it on my podcast. You guys know the Outlaw Nation is about speaking your truth, is about talking about what's going on passionately in your life, you know, and, and this is something that's certainly incredibly passionate for me. And unfortunately, you know, we've, we're, we're, we're reaching this point where there seems to be, it seems to feel like there's a divide that is very, very clearly exposed, being exposed uh, with the actions of the president, with the actions of these white supremacists and Nazi, Nazis and white nationalists in this march in Charlottesville. And we've seen a counter reaction to this now, these statues being taken down, taken down both uh, by uh, the mob in North Carolina, and that was a mob, uh, and also by um, people like in, by uh, elected officials like in Baltimore uh, and other er areas around the country. You know, Cory Booker this morning, the senator in New Jersey proposed taking down the Confederate statues from the um, from the government buildings there in Washington. So there's a lot going on that I think has been simmering on both sides underneath the surface for years, for decades, even. You know, in this. In this country's history, there is a constant back and forth about race. It really is an incredibly powerful topic that both sides uh, feel very strongly about and have reacted to very strongly as well. You know, the you know one side makes fun of politically correct and makes fun, you know says snowflakes and all this stuff, but they get just as butt hurt as as the side they're complaining about when like a statue comes down or an edict gets passed or you know a law gets put into motion that's about making things equal or fair for a situation in this country. And so I'm always miffed uh, at this idea that a that a country that has a 76% white population according to the 2016 census feels that they're being marginalized or that their voices aren't being heard. And I think this pertains to what I'm talking what you know the world I exist in now which is film and television. If you watch film and television it is overwhelmingly white, the leads and the characters and everything like that. So it's confusing to me when you say that you're being marginalized. You know, look at the leaders. It's overwhelmingly white. Even if you go into sports, which is what I love, the, the owners are overwhelmingly white. So this idea that somehow you're losing ground 
is a is a is an empty argument. It's not true. What's happening is that you're being asked to do more to exist in the world, to fight for your place in the world. That frustration I can understand. That is something that I think if you were to tell the truth about what's actually happening underneath a lot of these white nationalists and these supremacists and these Nazis is this feeling of disenfranchisement because they've been able to get along just coasting through life for a majority of their existence and now to all of a sudden have to really step up and work harder and do yeah you can't live off mom and dad anymore you can't like live off your buddies and you actually have to step up and fight and you can't just think that you're going to get moved up the chain just by showing up to work the, the people are more intelligent now the access to education is higher people's requirements in a global economy are more therefore you have to do more you know i was reading an article the other day that talked about how um actually w- women uh are more successful a- a- at education achieving degrees and uh, you know moving forward in education more that their scores are higher than men universities are having to almost affirmative action men men regardless of race into their universities because women are so much more advanced in an education sense from the beginning why because they understand the patriarchal nature of the world and they understand that they have to work harder and 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 fight more and learn more and to get ahead and to be successful they understand it from birth right men and specifically white men for the most part have like kind of had everything accessible to them they've never had to worry about you know being pulled over by cops at every moment being like you know passed over for a job because they have a dick and balls like these are these are things that men have never had to worry about and now they are and this is what i think is the birth of the or what is the genesis of this men's movements that's been happening in this white nationalism you know i mean if you look at the if you watch that vice piece on charlottesville you could see it's almost all white men you know there's like there there were like three or four i think you two or three really women that you saw in all the entire coverage of the white nationalists that marched uh uh, in charlottesville you know and it's interesting to see this i'm not saying white men white women aren't part of it i'm sure they're a part of it i'm just saying it's overwhelmingly male because there's this feeling of disenfranchisement right so this is how we need to i think we need to approach it is like and i don't mean this for understanding there's no way we need to be understanding white nationalists or nazis in terms of like allowing them access to uh to our government or to uh, to jobs or to whatever no hell no it's more about really getting these people to understand where they're coming from, like what's really at the base of their anger what's really at the core of their upset you know and you see this Cantwell dude and please if you haven't watched the Vice piece uh, on Charlottesville, go and watch it. It's on Facebook. Go to Vice. Uh, just type in Vice in capital letters, and it should come up on there. On you should go their Facebook page should come up. Go there. Go go to the video section, and you'll see the 22 minute video. As just go to videos, and you'll look for the one that says 22 minutes Charlottesville, and watch it. I guarantee you, it will affect you. It will unsettle you. It will show you something that maybe you didn't understand the power of which is in our country and is very powerfully in our country in ways that a lot of us probably don't understand or don't have access to, you know? I'm sure most people listening to me don't hang around a bunch of white nationalists or Nazis. You know, I'm not really your cup of tea if you're a white nationalist or a Nazi. I'm, you know, what they call a social justice warrior, which is another one of these stupid made-up terms uh, that people use to denigrate people's beliefs and ideas about having a progressive uh, society that embraces all colors, all races, all uh, um, sexual orientations you know this is these are the things that we we want to have happen in the world you know and and this is another thing too most white males don't grow up in a world where they're being excluded from opportunities exclude or being uh, uh you know like made fun of for uh, being a certain way or you know those kinds of things most white males don't experience that kind of thing you know they find camaraderie in other white males and act in certain ways to fit in and that's kind of how it is you know and so this whole idea that all of a sudden they're having to adjust their behavior adjust their uh, approach to the world adjust how they you know uh, uh look at the world is an interesting change that's happening and it's been happening since the 60s and the 70s. So as the as the 60s with the civil rights movement really you know put the spotlight on how white people had been treating black people in this country and uh, to lesser to an extension Native Americans. You know we had to be aware of that because the AIM movement in the 70s. Take a look at that AIM, the American Indian Movement. Research that. Look at that in the 70s. That was a movement in the 70s about 
getting people to understand why or the mistreatment of American uh, Native Americans in this country's history. Brando famously, Marlon Brando famously refused the Oscar uh, for The Godfather and sent up uh, this um, uh, American, uh, this Native American lady. Uh, her, I think her last name was Little Feather to accept the award and then make a speech about the treatment of Native Americans in this country. You know, and so there's the and then of course the civil rights movement in the '60s that was in the '70s, and then you had the fem- the the women's rights movements as well going on. You know about you know the equal rights amendment there was you know the burning of the bras there was all these kinds of things that were about you know finding their equality in society as well so yes i get it white men feel like from white men feel like oh you know we're being attacked from all sides some white men rather feel this way i think other white men understand why and understand that they're not like being tortured or beat up in the streets for these points of views or these things that have happened in the past it's more a matter of like look understand that this is here be aware of it because you're the person in power. That's what people are trying to say from the minority side. And if I can speak uh, for the gender side, from the women's side, is like, we're not trying to put you on a cross. What we're trying to do is get you to see that this is happening and, and, and not like take the blame for it. Just be aware of it. That's it. Just be aware of it. But I think these people to to like build up their movements have to twist these points of views, have to twist these approaches and find the most extreme approaches and make it seem as if that's the message because they have to uh, fight back somehow instead of accepting responsibility or accept not necessarily accepting, but at least changing their points of views on the world. And so they see it this way, you know, and so. I, in my opinion, I get what's happening on both sides. I see where this is coming from. I just think, I just want a better society. I want a better, more accepting society. I don't want us to be bogged down with this bullshit because it's being bogged down with this bullshit that keeps us from moving forward economically, keeps us moving forward as a country unified to build us back up. You know, watch that, watch that uh, um, three minute clip that Jeff Daniels does as the character in the newsroom where he talks about where we rank against other countries and all these all these areas of a country's existence and you see that we're not number 1 in almost anything of value and that's a shame and that's what we need to change in this country but we can't change it if we're caught up wanting to march backwards into history that's that has never worked in any empire in the history of the world and it won't work in ours it won't we are not special in that way that we will somehow be different, somehow buck the trend that the Roman Empire didn't do or these other empires that have existed for or the British Empire. Like Every single empire thought that they were the right empire they were going to rule for thousands of years and, and their, their uh, comfortable existence was never going to be threatened. But you see now that's happening. You know, we're one race war away from the entire country imploding. And that's on the horizon. That is on the deck, unfortunately, because we have someone in power who is president who's fomenting the most extreme views of these white nationalists and and Nazis and and white supremacists. He is giving them a voice. He is giving them validity. And that is scary. You know, and if you're one of these people listening to me going, no, well, the Black Lives Matter and Antifa or whatever that term is, anti-fascist, whatever they're trying to create with that term, or the, the far left, which is complete and utter horseshit, that term that Trump just invented to kind of combat this idea of the alt-right, even though they're the ones who embrace the alt-right tag, which is, of course, incredibly stupid. All of that is just like, it's just meant to sow division. It's not meant to, to unify. It's meant to sow division. And that's, that's the unfortunate uh, situation. You know, there used to be a time in this country where you would be like, okay, I hear what you're saying. You're right. Like, we passed civil rights legislation in the 60s, right? We, 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 we look to include more women in the workplace, more minorities in the workplace. Like we learned, we used to learn, but now there's just this anger to push back against, this anger to create division and create, uh, uh, what, what can I say, create terrible reasons for why people are doing the things that they're doing. They have to create these ideas that uh, black people and minorities and women are trying to unfairly Uh, vilify white males and it's like this is you can't play victim when you're the majority race in the country it's ridiculous you can't it's it doesn't make any sense you know Or, or the majority gender in this country you can't play victim you know you're in power with great power comes great responsibility
So if you're going to enjoy these superheroes and, you know, embrace their edicts, embrace the famous lines from their, uh, uh, their stories, it's got to apply to you. The reason heroes, superheroes have, have risen so, hard, so far in the last few years is, yes, there have been incredible talents that have embraced them and tried to create them on screen and bring them to life on screen, rather, in a way that was accessible and amazing and awesome and not campy or cheesy or childlike. But by the same token, these stories echo with us because they remind us of our real lives. They are uh, reminiscent of our real lives. There's things that touch us and move us and inspire us. And that's why they're here. You know, we need that in our country. We need that in our society. <clears throat> and that's what's happening. And so I lived in Charlottesville. So this weekend was really tough for me. You know, I, I, I moved there in 96, I think. Yeah, at the early part of 96, uh, I had just finished uh, my AA degree at night. And I was, uh, you know, I was in the reserves, in the Army Reserves. I had finished my AA degree. And I was considering whether to apply to colleges or not. You know, my first trip to college was not a pleasant experience. Um, I had a lot of terrible things happen to me. And it wasn't, it just wasn't my, my, I'm not trying to play a victim. I'm just saying that things happened to me and I was, not happy at that time during going to college. I never should have gone to college that early. I should have taken a year off and traveled or like just took, taken some time, worked a job and just figured the, my life out and what I really wanted to do, you know? And so all of that was just a terrible experience. So after like I slowly came back to college, taking these courses at uh, Northern Virginia Community College, I took, I got my AA degree. And then uh, my best friend, Maurice, who, like I said, uh, we, we've been friends since high school. He was the uh, sports uh, anchor at the time at uh, Channel 29 in Shawsville. And he said to me, he's like, well, there's a job open here uh, for a master control operator at the station. If you want to do that, you can come here, move in with me, because his roommate had just moved out. Move in with me. Try out Shawsville for a little bit while you figure out what you're going to do next with this AA degree. And if you're going to go back to college or if you're going to start looking at another career without a college degree, like all these kinds of stuff. So I took his offer. I took him up on his offer uh, and, and I moved in with him and we had a great time uh, living together. You know, we were friends watching movies, uh, playing fo- pickup football with people from the, from the station and friends we knew there in Charlottesville. And Charlottesville is a beautiful city. It is a beautiful city. And there's so much to see there. There's so much to experience. You know, and it's a city that shuts down around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. It's not a, a city that's going to keep you up till 2 or 3 a.m. You know, it's not a loud city in that way. Um, and there's a lot of access to like progressive culture. And also there's Virginia historical culture, Civil War culture there that you could go and take a look at battlefields and explore monuments and, you know, all these in a Monticello, like there's, which is right around there. So there's so much about Charlottesville that, that to me was a, such a pleasant experience and such an enjoyable experience. And I met a lot of great people there. And it's also where I started to discover my love for film, like real deeply, really deeply. And um, my friend Wade at the time uh, was working at the station with me at NBC 29. And he had graduated from the University of Chicago film program. And he was the one that like, made lists of movies for me to watch. So my job there was working overnight, which if anyone were, has ever worked overnight, it is hell on earth if you are not used. If you don't have that kind of uh, physical ability to work overnight, uh, it is hell on earth. It is legitimately hell on earth because you are working 10 to 12 hours, I mean 8 to 10 hours rather, overnight. And that was my shift. My shift was four days of 10 hours. So I would go in around 6 o'clock, is that right? Six, four, six, seven. No, no. I would go in around what? Like 11, I think. And then I would be there till 9 a.m. the next morning, which was, that was my schedule. So I would be all night. I would run commercials. I would run programs, PSAs, uh, all those things I was doing overnight into the Today Show, through the Today Show. And then I would go home and sleep. And that was my schedule. Uh, and, you know, On the days off or when I'd wake up and I had time before I went into work, I would go to UVA uh, and I would go into their library, which that was accessible to anybody. I got a, you know, obviously I got a library card. And what I did was I would rent laser discs and I would watch laser discs or DVDs uh, at these small little cubicle, wooden cubicle stations that they have in had in libraries back then. I don't know if they still have them now, but that's what I did back in the late nineties. And I would sit there and I would just watch movies all day. And this is where I started to really develop my love of film. And uh, so Charlottesville has a very special place in my heart for that reason too. It, it is where it's probably what led me to where I am today and why I've always enjoyed discussions about film. Because if you, 
listen to uh, this past week's Top 10 show, yeah, Siskel and Ebert are the ones that taught me how to look at film, but I had to watch a lot of film to understand and really get what they were seeing in films. Uh, and I was reading about uh, with, or watching them talk about films and reading about in separate in columns and in magazines like uh, Premier and Empire and uh, whatever uh, magazines were available there um, that you could read about film. Uh, and so... This was why Charlottesville is special to me because so much of uh, these, this is, it was a critical moment in my life. I was able to take a break, spend some time with a great, with my best friend and, you know, deepen our relationship as friends and also discover like coming, kind of come into my own about what I wanted to do next with my life. And so there's a lot about Charlottesville that uh, is very special to me and I've seen it grow and develop and it's a great college town to a degree, but it's also a great town itself, you know, and you have access to all class levels and you can experience the world through that. And you have, you know, there's this great area downtown where you can actually walk downtown on these brick uh, walkways and see all these great shops and little restaurants and movie theaters. And you can go out to the parks and walk around the parks and really enjoy nature. There's so much about it. And the hotels are nice. Like they're really relaxed, kind of, you know, like they're not too high end. They're just comfortable nice hotels you can stay there there's great concert experiences there now um, there's so much about it that I really enjoy there's nice college bars you have all you can experience in Charlottesville and it's all there for you historically and in the present and so and you can see lectures and you can get you there's so much access to education in that city too so to see it become this like touch stone this like cultural i don't know what do you call it what do you want to call it but whatever they call it there is like it's 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 something that sets sparks of flame you know see it become that for these white supremacists these white nationalists because they were taking down they vote the city council voted to take down these statues and they voted to take down the statues because look it's past time it's past time these statues represent a time in our country's history where they owned slaves and fought for slavery. This is not, see, this is what I think is Trump's uh, incredibly incorrect false equivalency. And that's done on purpose, by the way. He's doing that. He knows, he does not believe a word of what he's saying about comparing Lee and Stonewall Jackson to George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. It's nowhere near the same thing. He's trying to obscure the issue or obfuscate, obfuscate the issue so that you are left thinking, oh, well, maybe, uh, you know, are they just taking down slave owners' statues? No. No one's going after Lincoln. No one's going after uh, Washington or Jefferson or Adams or anybody else who was obviously Adams and didn't, didn't own slaves. But they're not going after uh, all these people who own slaves. They're going after these symbols of rebellion and dissension. These are people that seceded from the Union and attacked our country. They wanted to destroy our country and take over our country. Yes, you can explore the nuances of the Civil War and talk about, yes, it was about states' rights, it was about these kinds of things, but it did boil down to slavery, you know, as an institution. This was a major, major issue in the Civil War, and no explanation is going to take that away. It was a major issue in the Civil War, and so this, is, was, this was the reason why both sides fought. It was a, or rather one of the main reasons why both sides fought. And so what these statues do is they create rebellion in no other country are you able to launch a rebellion against that country and then have statues put up for the rebellious leaders that lost the war that's just not how it works in no other country are you allowed to do that none zero you know you don't see that happening you don't see the statues of hitler in germany you don't see that kind of stuff you know and so and obviously i'm not trying to compare lee to hitler don't get it twisted i'm just saying that what lee represented he, he, and no, 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 everyone says he's a good man. He was an intelligent man. He was an accomplished man. He was a very in, intelligent military tactician. All of that is great. But there are many great men who've made terrible decisions. He made a terrible decision to defend the South and their institution of slavery. Therefore, his statue must be taken down. You know, it doesn't mean that you remove the knowledge from history books. God, I hope they never remove the knowledge of conf the Confederacy and what they did, because that's a, that's a that's a that's a uh, a warning. You know, that's a that's a uh, that whole movement that what happened there is a, a lesson to be learned about how far this country can go in almost falling apart. You know, and how we shouldn't.
And I hate that they've taken the Reconstruction, which Lincoln was very benevolent to give to the South in order to, you know, welcome the South back into the Union, which he did. In essence, he did the right thing because you don't want to subjugate half your nation. You want your nation to feel a part of your nation again and come back together. But those divisions have been there since before the Civil War, and it seems like they're still there now in 2017. And that's unfortunate. It's it's a sad truth, you know, and uh, um, it's so unnecessary. It's so unnecessary. There are bad people on all races. It's not that black people are terrible or white people are terrible. That's not it at all. There are bad people in all races. So can't we all come together and say we all are together and there are bad people in all races? Therefore, it's not, you know, it's not one race should be higher above than another race or one race is more of a criminals than another race. That's these are the simplistic ways of thinking that destroy intelligent discourse and keep us from moving forward as I was saying earlier. You know, and you have to understand your history. Go and research, go and read. And I don't mean don't read that shit that's like pro one way or another. Just read the actual history of what happened. Read the new, read about the the complex issues that were involved in the Civil War, why they went so deep. Yes, for a lot of the Civil War, a lot of these states, slavery was their institution that allowed them to make money as, as, as business owners and as, uh, uh, and, and their economy as a state as well. I get it. The attack on slavery was the attack on the existence of the state. What were they going to replace that economy with? I get that. But at some point, this is a human issue. And what they did was they conveniently thought of black people as not human, right? They saw them as three quarters of a human being, which is to even think about that nowadays is is overwhelmingly offensive. And even Jefferson himself, let's let's not, you know, we're not going to wipe the slate clean here, but Jefferson himself said he didn't think the uh, the races could work together because black people once you freed them would be upset about having been slaves. And that's not that's logical. That's logical. He I think he compared it to like holding a wolf by the ear, you know, and once you let the wolf go, it's going to attack you. And rightly so because you subjugated it you put it in chains you made it work for you you dehumanized it you know you dehumanized slaves you dehumanized the african-american population you dehumanized them you ripped them apart from their families you put chains on them you put steel contraptions on their necks and on their bodies you whipped them you killed you worked them till they died and then you framed them for having sex with your white daughters. You saw all of this is the history of slavery in this country. Now, understanding that, I'm not saying that you need to make white people pay for this shit. In no way am I saying that at all. No. What I'm saying is understanding our history is not a negative. You know, you, you, you get mad at your father. You get mad at your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever. You get mad at family members and the people you love. Does that, and you point out the things they do wrong. Does that mean you, you like deny their existence or you abhor their existence? No, you're just showing them or you're talking about something that's wrong with them and that you'd like them to fix it. That's what this whole thing is all about. You know, pointing out what's wrong with the history of this country point, and, and making sure we don't repeat it is not hating this country. That's a stupid, stupid argument. It's a incredibly, uh, it's a it's a fallacy. It's an incredible fallacy, this idea. Like, if you complain about the United States, get the fuck out. Grow the fuck up, man. That isn't how it works about anything. You know, if you complain about your family, do you want them to get the fuck out? Do you, if you complain about, do you want to get the fuck out? Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does. Everybody, you know, uh, uh, sometimes doesn't listen to the right thing and makes mistakes. That's part of, Life is part of the world. And as a country, you are a reflection of, of, a, of humanity. Humans are flawed. They're going to make mistakes. So accept that you made a mistake. Apologize for the mistake and move forward. See, I thought Obama was our apology to all of that. We were going to move forward. But of course, the far right created these incredibly stupid things about Obama that he was like, you know, he wasn't really born here. And they would put like Hitler mustaches on him and all this kind of bullshit. Uh, instead of embracing the fact, look, look what we've done as a country. We've come so far that we have elected an African-American. Now let's go forward. You know, let's go forward. But instead, we're, we marched backward with our knuckles dragging on the ground to elect this fucking cretin like Trump into the White House. And that's, I mean, and look what's happening. Look what's happening. This isn't something that Obama, and that's a stupid argument too, that people are saying like, oh, Obama created these racial divisions. Bull fucking shit. These racial divisions have been around for centuries in our country and for centuries in other countries as well. Race is a 
powder keg of a subject and people and it's easy for people to look at a person who's different and vilify them it's so easy it's easier than understanding them it's easier than taking a look at yourself in the mirror it's easier than having to analyze what their uh, arguments or their complaints or their issues have been through history it's easier to not listen than it is to listen and I hope what Charlottesville did was wake us all up about needing to listen and yes including listening to the white supremacists and the neo-nazis see what not to teach your children see what not to believe see what not to become you know especially with someone like cantwell if you watch that vice uh special like this is a guy who is incredibly insecure i mean you don't pull out seven guns on camera and not radiate small dick syndrome you just don't that's that's something a, a wuss would do Look how tough I am. I got my guns. I got my guns. And then, of course, one day later when a warrant gets issued for his arrest, he's crying like a little bitch on camera. That tells you that he's an insecure, lost guy who's trying to find some kind of strength in this movement that he does not have in his life, some kind of strength or power that he does not have in his own life. He thinks other people are to blame for his loss of power rather than himself. And that's what I mean. It's easier to look at someone else for taking something away from you than taking responsibility for the fact of your decisions and your mistakes and your errors in your life. And what I talk about on this show all the time is fight for your life. And I don't mean fight for your life by blaming other people. I mean fight for your life by taking a look at the patterns that you are doing in your own life, the self-destructive patterns, the patterns that lead you down the bad path, the decisions that lead you to pain or hurt, that we keep repeating these patterns because you don't have enough self-love in your heart for yourself. You know what's right and what's wrong and you're doing the wrong things and expecting different results. And so what I'm telling you is you need to stop doing that. And that's what I keep saying every week. Fight for your life means take a look at yourself. Read the books on psychoanalysis. Take a look at these situations. Look, see, Take a hard look at yourself in the mirror and still love. See your flaws. See the things you need to work on. But also see the incredible things about yourself. Also see the good things and let those rise. Let those inspire you to fight against the bad things about your personality or the, or the flaws in your, in your ways of thinking and become a better person, become a stronger person, become a person who's steeped in self-love rather than a person who's steeped in self-hate. And those people who are white supremacists, that's all hate. That's self-hate. That's feelings of inadequacy. Those are feelings of an inability to find any power in their lives because they think the system has fucked them over. The system that is created to make sure white people get everything they want in life they somehow, because they're on the outside looking in because of their decisions, their mistakes, their inability to be intelligent enough to take advantage of those opportunities, they want to blame other people. And no one survives by blaming other people. Even Trump. He will not survive this presidency. He will not survive. There. You're already Republicans are turning from him. John Kelly, who just got in there as the chief of staff, is already expressing his frustration that there's no discipline. He can't control the president. Nobody can control that guy because he is an incredibly insecure son of a bitch who needs attention all the time for everything he does and he will run to any group that will stoke his ego and these white supremacists white nationalists who help get him in office they're the ones he keeps catering to because he's stoked ego. i mean uh, jimmy kimmel pointed out last night right he tweeted about amazon yesterday morning and he was more angry about amazon than he was about the white nationalists and there's no don't give me this crap that he said all this stuff over the weekend in the speech that he read off of a, off a you know piece of paper that it looked like it was so painful for him to read it. Finally saying what needed to be said from the beginning on Saturday, he said this stuff on Sunday or Monday, he said this stuff, and then he went on that press conference, and in that press conference, he completely set fire to it all. He completely set fire to it all by blaming the alt-left, which doesn't exist. It's, a, it's just a stupid term. It was all done to vilify Rather than take responsibility saying, hey, you know what? I fucked up. You're right. I apologize. I should have responded sooner. This is what I really mean. This is what I should have said. Instead of accepting responsibility, he put it on everyone else. He blamed everyone. He tried to shift the argument. And now this morning, he's shifting the argument to Confederate statues. And there's our history and our history, which is, of course, utter horseshit. And it's just meant to uh, mar the issue. It's meant to you know, make it all foggy instead of very clear, which it is. So, you know, I don't know where we go from here. It really unsettles me and I'm scared, honestly, in my heart for where we go as a country because this man in power sows division, sows division in ways that I've never, ever seen. And I've been alive since, you know, since uh, Nixon, you know, and so it's, it's just, 
it's an inc- it's an unfortunate thing that we're watching happen in our country. And I hope we find a way out, man. I really do, because I I I want us all to come back together and feel the peace and love and joy that this country can be and bring us back to being the best country in the world legitimately, you know, legitimately. And I love living here. I love my country. I served my country for eight years. You know, I fought for my country in my heart, you know? And so, um, I'm never, I'm not going anywhere and I love this country. And I watch, I just want us to embrace the greatness of what we once were and embrace it again. And I do think we'll get there. I do think we have serious opportunity to get there. And I think what he has done indirectly is expose all this stuff so that we can take a look at it, which is no different. It's a larger scale to what you need to do in your life. Ex- ex- he exposed the negative things that are there. Take a look in the mirror. Make those changes. <laughs> I, know, I sound like Michael Jackson. Man in the mirror. <laughs> make that change. You know, you got to do these things so you can come out the other side, you know, and, and be better. You know, and I, I wish that for all of you. And I wish that for this country, honestly. And I hope we get there. I really do. I want us to. In my heart of hearts, I want us to. Uh, all right, that's enough of that. Let's uh, move on to the next title. Let's move on to some stuff a little more lighter, a little more cheerier. Um, right after this, I'm going to talk about um, Thor. Did you see the Thor Ragnarok trailer? Game of Thrones? Let's talk about this. I'll be right back. All right, welcome everybody to the second half of the Outlaw Nation podcast. Uh, thanks for sticking with me through that whole, uh, you know, treatise on the Charlottesville situation and my personal uh, points of view on it. Uh, but let's move on to stuff that's a little more fun, a little more ta- a little more interesting. Uh, did you guys get a chance to see the international trailer, the Japanese trailer for Thor Ragnarok that dropped uh, this morning? I guess so. Uh, this morning being Thursday morning. Um, what a trailer! Like it, it incorporated a, a lot of the uh, uh, obviously what we'd seen before in the other trailers, but we got some more Doctor Strange. In fact, Doctor Strange is who leads us into the trailer by telling Thor that his you know he's got a feeling his life is going to change, which of course and you know kind of foreshadows what's going to happen with Hela, Kate Blanchett's character. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, I am once again driving while I record this podcast. That's just my life, man. I've told you before, I'm super busy, super busy. So anyway, what a uh, this. This is awesome. I just loved. I love everything about this film and all the trailers that have come out. And Taika Waititi has done just such great work promoting it since Comic Con. Uh, and of course, it's starting to ramp up because it's going to come out in November. So of course, we're going to see more uh, stuff with him, more stuff with Hemsworth, more stuff. I'm sure with Tom Hiddleston, with Mark Ruffalo, you know, all that. And so uh, to me, it's just it's super exciting because I think this is the one Thor movie that everyone seems to have been waiting for. You know, and it's not that Thor isn't, uh, you know this uh, very noble, powerful god, uh, but there was the best Thor stories all, they always had this like little smirk in them. And uh, to know that that's finally, you know, really being brought out by what what, what Taika Waititi is doing is, is exciting, you know, and, all, and everything about the, uh, the new, tr- the new uh, poster, the font of the poster, all that stuff is just, um, it's, I think it's just hitting all the right notes and all the right chords for people who have maybe not been the biggest fan of the first two Thor movies. This one seems to be, you know, one they're looking forward to giving it a chance to see if maybe they're going to enjoy themselves and really see Thor brought out in a way that's less stuffy or less, uh, rigid. And I know for me, having sat through the panel comic con, which I talked about a couple weeks ago on the show, uh, I'm nothing but excited. It's like one of my most anticipated films uh, for the rest of the year. So I hope it hits it. And and having Doctor Strange come in is interesting too because now you've got this kind of, it's not Guardians of the Galaxy, right? But Thor was never really one of the main, main characters of Marvel. So now you've got Thor with Hulk, with Doctor Strange, with Loki. And then we've got Valkyrie with Tessa Thompson. She looks just fantastic. And then you have, of course, Kate Blanchett never looking more powerful or more sexy than she does as Hela. Um, which, of course, probably speaks to my uh, lunacy about uh, enjoying kind of uh, 
uh, women from the other side of the tracks. <laughs> so that kind of stuff. I just love it. I think it's a great combination of of um, of characters and of actors, and also the imagery. My God, when you see the imagery of Valkyrie with her winged horse, like with the, with the, with the Pegasus or Pegasi, whatever you want to say, the winged horses coming through and Hela shooting all her uh, you know weapons at them. It just all of it looks like it's going to be literally otherworldly. And so I can't. I'm I'm nothing but incredibly excited. And Doctor Strange being in there throws a whole another element and and uh, a vibe to the film because. Doctor Strange himself, the film, it was serious, but it also had its tongue firmly planted in his cheek as well, which the best Marvel movies do. And you can see that happening here with the situation too as well. So I can't wait to see what they do with this and how the, what the end result is like. And I'm going to do everything I can to get into a screening of this early so I can enjoy the film uh, ahead of time. Uh, so and, and I just wonder how far they're going to push it with this. You know, mind your business. This guy's looking over at me. Mind your business. So we're going to see how far it's going to go and, and where they're going to take it. Um, and I, I, I'm just uh, super excited to see what TT can do with it. All right, let's move on to Game of Thrones. Have you? Did you guys watch East Watch? If you haven't watched East, East Watch, then uh, this is probably the point where you should turn the spoiler alerts. You know, this is a spoiler alert situation. Uh, so if you haven't watched East Watch, this is your point. This is your, so this is the pause for you to turn it down. Or fast forward to the end. But what an episode, right? You guys must have enjoyed that very much. The reveal of John Targaryen, uh, the reveal of Jon Snow being a Targaryen. All this happening, you know, him connecting with the dragon, with Drogon. You know, people have an issue with how I say it. Drogon, Drogon. How do you want to say it? Drogon, I don't know. It's stupid. People have this issue with how I say certain names. They go crazy. Like, how fucking pathetic is your life that you've got an issue with how I'm saying the character of a fantasy fucking show, for God's sakes? Like, seriously, dude. Or a person. Like, Seriously. Come on. You know who I mean. You know who I'm talking about. Someone tweeted me. He was oh, commenting on you. He was driving me nuts how he's saying bra instead of brand. Bra. You know who the fuck I meant? Jesus. You know, it's just kind of, that's the kind of shit that's like, you know who I'm talking about. You know who I mean. Are you really going to let, it's like people when I did the Walking Dead, we get so upset at how I said Michonne instead of Michonne. And they're like, you you, you should know how to say it. You're going to do the review. It's like, Come on, man. You know, don't let that obscure the points that I'm trying to make, you know? So those are those things that kind of bother me sometimes. Anyway, really enjoy the episode. And I think it sets us up for in two incredibly powerful episodes to end the season. You know, this next one's going to be, what, the longest episode of the season. It's going to be the battle. We've got the Magnificent Seven rolling out there into the into the, uh, into the the uh, winterlands, into beyond the wall to see uh, what's going to happen. And they're, they're going to, you know, obviously go against the Night King, up against the White Walkers. That's going to be so much fun. Who's going to live? Who's going to survive? Who's going to be, uh, who's going to come out on top? Oh, I wonder. I wonder who is going to come out on top, you know, and there's been rumors that, you know, uh, Michelle Boyd, I think, uh, texted this to Ken and uh, said, like, uh, do you, I think it's going to be Jorah, that Jorah becomes the white, Sir Jorah becomes the white and they bring him back, which would suck, right? That he fought through all this stuff, f- essentially friend zone the whole time he's been on the show with Danny and then, you know, survives grayscale just to become a white to serve his purpose to, uh, you know, get Danny and Cersei maybe together to fight the White Walkers. And someone suggested that uh, that uh, um, Cersei might give up her baby to the Night King to, like, uh, you know, uh, form an alliance with the, with the Night King to go against Danny. Are you insane? This woman has lost so many children. If she loses another one, she's going to lose her mind. You know, I wrote about this on the trackingboard.com, uh, one of my last columns uh, that I'm writing for them, because uh, I can't say yet the reason why, but... Um, I had to step down uh, because another opportunity presented itself. So uh, I wrote about how they're treating Danny and uh, um, Sansa and like how people or the fans aren't really factoring in this PTSD stuff that might be going on between the, with them, just like it's going on with uh, with Theon, with John. Like maybe, you know, the stuff with Cersei. Cersei and, and I think Benioff or Weiss in one of those post- uh, show uh, clips that they do when you watch Game of Thrones on HBO, they said that Cersei has not dealt with the death of her children. She has not let it sink in. She has not let it affect, like she's not really processed their deaths. And you could see her like snapping a little bit in this last episode when they were about, when uh, uh, Jamie was telling her about 
what Olena had told him about killing Joffrey. And, you know, she didn't want to believe it at first. She was like, no, why'd you buy it? Of course you bought it. Did she do it? Like, she thought she had the, the high ground with him. And then he busted that logic out on her about, like, who would you rather have, your, have had your daughter married to? Who would you have been able to control more, Tom and her Joffrey? And then just like that. And you see her almost start to have, like, a facial twitch, a facial tick. And then she, she, she reins it back in and then just, just destroys Jamie verbally and pulls rank on him and everything like that. So it's just, oh, man, just, just great stuff going on with all these characters and all these... All these, uh, you know, all these incredible uh, storylines. So uh, I can't wait to see how this all plays out in the next episode. And no, I haven't watched the leaked episode. I'm not going to watch that stuff. I don't support that stuff. So I, 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 you know, don't come at me on Twitter and give me spoilers. And I've avoided all that crap on purpose so I can stay away from all that stuff and keep it fresh in my mind and watch it. Uh, for the first time uh, on Sunday night, you know, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be incredible, incredible. And it may be the best episode of Game of Thrones. We shall see. We shall see. Everything's been set up that way. You know, I mentioned the, the article I wrote recently. Uh, I wrote it uh, a couple of days ago. It just, it just dropped on Wednesday, but, the, you know, I wrote it a couple of days ago, but they dropped it on Wednesday on Tracking Board. I was just exploring this idea of how we're approaching or the writers and creators are approaching uh, Sansa and Danny. And it's, it's, it started to bother, like, I Obviously, over the years, we've seen, you know, there have been articles writing about the misogyny and uh, how they treat people of color on the show, you know, which, and there are some, there have been some very valid points in, in these articles. And I've listened to these articles. I've, you know, I've kind of kept them in the back of my mind. And, you know, as I look at the show, because I enjoy the show, I love the show, but those, you know, but sometimes you can't, those things, like, that's what I love about analysis. It's supposed to make you look at things in a certain way and question them. And, you know, you shouldn't just love something, uh, you know, uh, unconditionally. Nothing is perfect. Nothing. So there's nothing wrong with looking at something and analyzing it and finding maybe ways that it's not kind of stepping up or or, or uh, hitting its goals and uh, or or you know marginalizing people. And it seems to me with Danny and Sansa this season, they seem to be doing that. You know, they seem to be using these other characters to undercut the Sansa and Danny storyline. You know, you have Arya questioning Sansa. You have Arya bringing up this whole thing about her being as, you know, like, oh, you like nice things that made you feel better about than everyone else. And then Arya, of course, is doing this unrealistic way of ruling, which is cutting people's heads off, which is, which it, Sansa's right about. That's no way to get people to be on your side. Sansa's absolutely right about that, you know? And, and then on the other side, you have Danny with, with uh, you know, uh, Tyrion questioning everything she does, questioning how she's meeting out her justice. But the whole reason they're in this situation of using the dragon dragons earlier and, you know, having to burn people on these supply routes is because Tyrion got totally destroyed by Jamie and military strategy. Jamie, and he admitted it. He admitted it on the episode. He said, you were three steps ahead of me. You know, and of course, Tyrion gets to like do all his plans and machinations and of course, never feels the pain of the mistakes he's made. Even walking amongst the battlefield in that episode, he's looking for Jamie, and maybe he's feeling terrible for the people he has, you know, he used to uh, command in the in the Blackwater uh, a battle now dying on on the battlefield to dragons, to dragon fire. So this is a, I, I just feel like the show is like, Hey, other people get to get away with the stuff and, and Danny and, and Sansa seem to be made, made to pay for their mistakes or their missteps and we forget that they're young we forget that they've been raped on their wedding nights both we forget that they've had to endure life threatening situations over and over again and so what do you think that how do you think that affects someone how do you think that messes with someone's head you know with Sansa it's interesting because Sansa's trying to keep the house of Stark alive she doesn't want to fall back into the trap and the situation she had when uh, when you know what she endured when she endured what she endured she doesn't want to be sold off again or married off again in a terrible situation so her mindset is to keep the house of Stark alive and powerful and so why wouldn't you do everything possible to plan for a future without Jon Snow just in case? But the show makes it seem as if she's being like power hungry and that she's, she's Cersei light by having like little finger around her to give her ideas and give her uh, advice. Even though she's shown that she's like doesn't, you know, ignores him a lot of the time, does take some of his advice, but also ignores him. She knows what she's doing. She's on top of the grain storage. She's correcting the armor. She's planning for a future without John just in case. And that's not, you know, like an incorrect philosophy to have. John has already died trying to do his foolhardy bullshit. And so you see him now going off against the council of the of the uh, of the Lords of the North to go to Sansa or to go to Danny to get the Dragonstone. 
He's been there the whole time. Uh, and now he's going off beyond the wall to try to bring back a white in this harebrained scheme to try to uh, get uh, Cersei to see the logic. And this is, I mean, it's like dealing with Trump. You know, n- No logic is going to work here. No logic is going to work here unless you're kowtowing to him and kissing his ass and stroking his ego. And the same thing, I think the same tactics would work with Cersei. If you were to kowtow to her, bend the knee, kiss her ass and stroke her ego, she'd be all about you. But, you know, but that's not that's not happening here. And I'm not, okay, for all you fucking people going nuts on YouTube, I'm not trying to correlate Cersei, saying like, they wrote Cersei to mirror Trump. That's not it. I'm just saying any ruler in that kind of situation, there are similarities, similarities to Cersei and Trump, and I'd be an idiot not to see them. You know, and so you can see it there. She abuses power. He abuses power. She's trying to maintain power by, you know, uh, uh, manipulating the press or uh, not the press necessarily, but manipulating the message out there saying this is a this is a foreigner who's bringing these, you know, savages, these hordes and giving them a voice and a say in your and how she rules the kingdom and how you're being ruled. Like there's all of this. There's so there's correlations there to be seen and to be had. And so to me, I think it's common comical that that people are are upset at me on youtube for seeing it like that's so ridiculous it's obvious to me you know so there you go but i think it adds an element to the show that makes it more attractive more interesting because you see that happening you see that going on you see that uh you know like uh coming stronger and stronger every week you know you see the correlations to relevant part of what makes us enjoy shows no matter where they're set in the time period is that we can relate to them because of our own personal lives or on personal experiences in our in our worlds in our countries in our families you know and, and so that that's what's so great about it and i think the show certainly does that uh many many times over uh so you know you see what's happening here and and i so i just don't think i don't understand this whole idea of like making sansa seem like a terrible person she's endured so so much to all of a sudden twist her into some kind of Cersei thing, I just think would really would upset me, you know, because I think the message it sends is incorrect as well. And the same thing with Danny. If they turn Danny into the Mad Queen, all the shit that she's gone through for six and a half seasons, and then all of a sudden this season, it seems like the show has become Jon Snow's show. It's been Jon Snow the whole time, even though the show has sold us a bill of goods. It has been Danny's story the whole time. John has John's story has been there. Obviously, it's been like it's grown in terms of, of importance as people ahead of him have been killed off. Uh, all of a sudden, his his storyline has become the main storyline out of the Stark household, and you know now possibly over the Targaryen. Now that he has even more claim to the throne than Danny does, so this is. I, I wonder how they're going to play this thing out. I really hope they don't uh, mess it up in that way, that they that they might like piss away these storylines in pursuit of something a little less noble or a little less easy to do, which is to make Jon Snow the actual heir to the whole situation. And I, I wonder if he'll be the one sitting on the throne. Like, I see the logic, of course. The one person who doesn't play the Game of Thrones is the one person, person sitting on the Game of Thrones or, or sitting on the throne. Uh, at the end of the Game of Thrones, so uh, it's certainly possible. I see the logic, but I think if you you know you create these incredibly powerful, complex, layered, rich female characters, and then you turn them into stereotypes, or you turn them into these characters that are not going to, in the end, receive any kind of reward for all they've endured. I just don't see the logic of it. And this has nothing to do with the fact, like, I get it. Yes, Game of Thrones, not everyone gets gets what they want or gets what they need. You know, it's not it's not always going to work out for them in that way. That is the main story of Game of Thrones. But we've seen that in numerous storylines. Why would we need to see it again with Sansa and Danny? What would be the fucking point of seven seasons of watching these two to have them, like, uh, you know, become mentally unfit to rule? Uh, it just it's just all of it it just it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth and I, I'm holding out hope that they turn it around in these last two episodes but we'll see all right that's uh, I think that's it for this week uh, there's not much more I wanted to really get into so I want to thank you guys so much for listening to the outlaw nation podcast this week and thanks again uh, to everybody at the SK plus podcast channel for supporting this show and promoting this show I want to tell you there's so many great shows on there the after Schmodown, the Schmodown rundown or the after show rather the Schmodown rundown uh, don't be a beardo 
and of course the top 10 show and my show the outlaw nation all of it on the sk plus podcast channel so, so subscribe leave comments leave ratings do all those things that you want to do uh to support the the podcast channel because we really appreciate it and we support you guys back as well in interacting with you all and listening to your tweets and listening to your thoughts so uh, i really appreciate y'all taking the time to download and listen and leave me your comments what do you think about everything i had to say what do you think about what i said about game of thrones what do you think about thor are you excited as i am you know what do you think about the stuff i said about charlesville the stuff I said about trump like i want to interact with you all yeah leave me comments leave everything like that on youtube or on or tweet at me or you know if you if you follow me on instagram do that uh and my social media is at the Roca says T H E R O C H A S A Y S. Follow me there for all the stuff I'm doing and for my announcement that should be happening soon. So, all right, thanks everybody for listening, and we will talk to you all next week. And I'm trying to line up a very special guest that I haven't had on the Outlaw Nation podcast before or on any podcast before, and I hope he and I can uh, kind of figure out our schedules to make it happen, and we shall see. All right, talk to you all next week. Bye-bye.